guys hear me? Test. Okay. Hold on a second. I, I've always wanted to do this. That's so cool. All right. Sorry. This this stage is amazing. This venue is amazing. Um, to start off, I I want to thank Mike and Jameson. Like, it's a real privilege to be able to have all you guys' attention. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate you guys, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. So today I'm going to talk about the Frankenstein framework and where I see kind of a potential future of the web and some changes in the ecosystem that are really interesting. But first we have to talk about the history of the web. For my purposes today, I've broken up the web into three separate eras, the document web, the hybrid web, and the application web. With the document web era, things were primarily rendered on the server. So you made a request to a server, it grabbed some sort of static file, it rendered that static file. Or if the server was particularly smart, you made a request to the server, it did some dynamic stuff, it sent you back a response. Libraries in this era augmented the platform using non-standard monkey patching. So I'm talking MooTools, Prototype. They had really excellent APIs, but if anyone remembers trying to use like MooTools and jQuery on the same site, it was a real nightmare. Like jQuery added this bougie no conflict thing where you could like call no conflict and get back a variable, but for the most part they didn't they didn't play nice together. Libraries in this era leveraged plugin libraries to share code. So if you wanted to write jQuery code, uh, you had to go to jQuery.com and go to their plugin library, and they had like a star rating system, and 99 out of 100 times the plugin was dead. Like, do you guys remember like having to install these really ghetto plugins? It was it was awful. Same thing with MooTools. You go to MooTools.net, and their plugin system came like way late in the game. You were you were installing these plugins from this weird PHP plugin repo. It was, at the time, it was really hot, but, but looking back, it, it was a step. And globals were used as a code sharing mechanism. People used to, at job interviews, test if you understood the immediately invoked function expression. Like, that was really important to understand scoping, right? So we had no module systems, no way of sharing code. We had globals. And people talked over globals, and there was a lot of clever ways to talk over globals. Then the web had sort of an awkward teenage phase, at least I call it an awkward teenage phase, sort of the puberty of the web, if you will. It was the hybrid web. Things weren't a single page app, they were still server-side rendered, and they came down with a ton of JavaScript. And we called this progressive enhancement. We took the document web, and we tried to bring it forward into the application web, but we couldn't really do it because we were supporting these old browsers, right? So you wanted to use this cool new engaging experience, but you couldn't because you were falling back to an older browser. So we called this progressive enhancement. We were sending down gobs of JavaScript, and we were bringing the page to the future, if you will. Uh, people were starting to get more serious about JavaScript. This is when Ajax started to get popular. You could make requests back to the server and grab data. It was like this amazing thing. And then you could render it into client-side templates. Then the web grew up to the application web, and this is kind of where we are today, though I'm going to argue that we're a little bit further ahead than the application web. Applications are rendered completely on the client. There are still some remnants of the document web. For example, isn't it kind of weird that we send down an HTML document and then build up the whole thing with JavaScript? Like, that's sort of a historical artifact more than anything else. Applications, or JavaScript frameworks in this era provided application architectures. So we're talking like Backbone, Ember, Angular, et cetera, and we were augmenting um, application structure. What are the frustrations of doing a polyglot framework based on this history? There's no good code sharing story, so no one can agree on a module system. Like the module system warfare has been a nightmare. Um, if you remember, Backbone had like AMD support for like two days, and then they took it out. And some people support CommonJS, and some people are like, let's do UMD, which is like, just I mean, it works, but it's 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 a it's a horrific hack. Um, there's just no good code sharing story. Frameworks require utmost buy-in. 
So my point here is that if you wrote Angular code, you were writing to Angular's module system. And if you wrote Ember code, you were writing to Ember. And if you wrote Backbone code, you were writing to Backbone. So you were coupled to the framework itself. You weren't writing just vanilla JavaScript. You were writing code for that particular framework. The code publishing story was pretty bougie. If you, if you remember, we had like this weird, these weird plugin repos. Um, and the issue tracking was like, if you want to file a bug for Mutuals, you go to like this lighthouse issue tracker. There was no standardized issue tracking. But things are brewing. I, I think a polygon framework is possible today. The code sharing story is solved. The days of common JS versus AMD versus UMD versus Ember's weird thing versus Sprout Core's weird thing, et cetera, they're gone. We can now depend on the ES6 module format. So we have a common format to share code across these different um, applications and different libraries. The platform itself has changed. We now have evergreen browsers. So historically, we had to augment the web in a serious way. We had to like bring the web forward to the future, which is still true, but we now have a different story to do that. We no longer abstract the web behind a library or framework. We polyfill the web to bring it forward into the future. The benefit of polyfills is that if somebody polyfills a promise, multiple libraries can consume that polyfill browser rather than all having to write to jQuery's promises or Q's promises. The ecosystem itself has changed. People take this for granted, but we have an agreed upon code publishing story, which is significant. GitHub fundamentally changed our industry, which, which people don't consider very often. They just take it as this like, oh yeah, let's use GitHub. But, but we now have a, a blessed issue tracker. We have a blessed way of knowing whether a project's dead or alive and forking a project. NPM officially opens their doors to the browser. This gives us proper versioning semantics for using vendor code. We don't have to go download some library, put it into like a bougie script tag, or worse, like some grunt task that's going to concatenate them. We have um, um, a package manager. And frameworks are compositions of smaller libraries. I, I don't know how many of you follow um, existing like, like frameworks. Probably most of you follow all of them. but. The future of these JavaScript frameworks are all compositions of smaller libraries. Like Ember is a, is a composition of smaller libraries. Angular 2 is a composition of smaller libraries. React itself is a library. Backbone is a library. So this means we can start to polyglot the best parts of these frameworks together if, if we so choose. Which brings me to the Frankenstein. The Frankenstein is one attempt at polyglotting all of these different frameworks into one thing. But first, we have to bring the, the past, uh, we have to bring the future to the past with our Mad Developer Lab, which brings me to my tooling, which today we're going to be using Webpack. With Webpack, we have a custom, a, 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 a feature called custom loaders. And you can think of custom loaders as sort of like a pipe. Like, you take Mario, you put him through the pipe, and on the other side, he's a different Mario. He's like a bigger Mario, right? He eats that mushroom, and he's like, Boop, you know, I love games, sorry. Anyways. You guys, are you guys okay? Yeah. All right, all right. Like it's like it's tense out there. Jeez, it's stressing me out. But uh, anyways, you take these your code. You take the code from the future, if you will, ES6 code. You put it through this pipe. You have the code of today. It's really rad. So let's do a quick example of setting up Webpack. Unfortunately, you guys don't have GitHub, but I do. If any of you want to follow along, it's just on my GitHub repo. We, I have this whole tutorial that we're going to go through today. So the first thing you do is you install Webpack Server. Can you download it? Yeah, I will. How's that? So you make a configuration file. This is what Webpack looks for. Oh, great. Great, great fetching start. So you have this entry. This is where Webpack's going to go look for your code. And then the file that it's going to build is this file called Frankenstein. 
So we got to go make that source Frankenstein file. And for now, I'm just going to console log it's alive. So there's this really cool feature with Webpack Dev Server that brings it forward to the application web completely. And it'll actually generate a HTML document for you. You don't have to like make a stub HTML doc and put your script tag in there. So we're now running through Webpack. We're console logging it's alive. We've got our build tool set up. This isn't a Webpack talk. I think there is a Webpack talk, though. And I highly recommend going to it, because Webpack is an amazing tool. Yesterday. Nice. Sorry, I, I've been so busy uh, with, a, uh, with another conference. So which brings me to my next tool, Babel.js, which gives us ES6, that module format I was telling you about, like this blessed uh, module format. We have ES6 tools, which what we're focused on today is the module system. So this gives us import and export syntax. We no longer have to write to CommonJS or AMD, et cetera. We can write ES6 modules. So let's augment our Webpack example really quick. We're going to npm install the Babel loader. Augment our configuration. What this does is it tells Webpack everything that's in source folder that ends with JS, run it through Babel. Let's make a new folder. I'm sorry, I keep opening these tabs and they're tiny. So we can use ES6 class syntax here. And we export default Frankenstein. So this is how we're going to export our classes or our files. And inside our Frankenstein, we're going to import Frankenstein from monsters, Frankenstein. And then we'll new up our Frankenstein. We're on Webpack Dev Server. Oh, yeah. And we're, we're alive for me as six. So now we've got the ability to write ES6 modules today. And the great thing about Webpack is it's flexible enough. It's kind of like JavaScript in that it's flexible enough that we can band-aid the current situation we're in. So JavaScript itself as a language is awesome because it's so flexible that we can do all sorts of crazy things to make it more usable for applications. So finally, we can get to the interesting part. Let's start compositing these frameworks into a polygon framework. Our subjects today are going to be React, because it's a wonderful view layer. Angular, first dependency injector. Actually, Angular 2, first dependency injector and Flatiron for routing, because it's a very beautiful agnostic router. So let's get uh, started with Angular 2. Unfortunately, this stuff isn't out yet, so you have to install these. For now, we have to install these pre-versions. So we're going to install a particular version of uh, DI. Again, Webpack is such a flexible tool that even though Angular 2 is currently implemented with Tracer, we can get Tracer running with Webpack using another loader. So we have to install this imports loader. So we're telling Webpack here, when you encounter the Tracer runtime, install globally the window object, because normally you don't have access to that in uh, these modules. So 
So we now have in your DI. Let's go ahead and have DI instantiate this guy. This is how you make a new injector in Angular DI. You just import it and instantiate it. And then you can ask the injector to create a new object for you. So what's really cool about this is we can now use a dependency injector to stub out our modules at test time. I don't know if any of you guys have played with Angular 2's DI, but it's actually really neat because it uses the actual classes as tokens. So it works based on annotations, which they're currently involved with TC39 and standardizing, so hopefully we can, uh, we can get that standardized uh, so we don't have to use JavaScript the way that we have to today for annotations because it's kind of gross. But um, let's go ahead and make sure this is still constructing. Oh, I got to restart Webpack. I'm sorry. And it's alive. So we're no longer creating our objects. We have Angular DI creating our objects. The cool thing about Angular DI is we're not particularly coupled to the DI framework. The code can still be run without DI. As you can tell with this Frankenstein class, we had nothing to do with DI in there, which historically, historically we had to register it with the Angular dependency injector. But now we can use the class itself as a token for the injector. We don't have to uh, register it. So what's next? React.js. By the way, I, this whole building the Frankenstein thing, I was super stoked about this. So I want you guys to appreciate it. Thank you. Um, this one's easy. We install React. No configuration needed. We can make a new Frankenstein component. So since we're using DI, we're going to be using these factory functions, which um, will allow DI to create, pass back a component class. Um, for time's sake, I'm going to copy it and paste it and explain it to you. So we import React. We import annotations and inject from DI. We import Frankenstein. And then this is how we have to do annotations today as opposed to an annotation syntax. We tell it to annotate the Frankenstein component and then we inject a new Frankenstein model. So then we're going to print I am monster.name. But we need to augment our model to have a name. So let's go ahead and crack open source monsters Frankenstein, which is our model. Nice, Vim, nice. I try to use Vim on these things to look smart and stuff, but it never goes well. Now we have to render. Um, we have to render this bad boy. So the cool thing is, is we can still use React or uh, Angular DI to create our new component. We import React. We ask React to render the app into the document body, which Webpack Dev Server is super rad and will give us a document body. And now we're rendering React with Angular 2's dependency injector. So we have something to wire our code together that allows us to decouple it properly during test time. So we can grab Frankenstein, we can new it up ourselves. We can grab our component even and new it up ourselves without the DI. Uh, or we can use DI to instantiate things. 
which we're now on to, see I have to go back to the slides because I really want you to see this. We're adding the leg of Flatiron. Flatiron is an awesome library. It has a goal of being isomorphic, working on Node and the browser. For our purposes today, we're gonna to be using this tool called Director, which is a, a really a framework agnostic router, which facilitates a lot of the polyglot behavior. So again, we npm install it. Let's make a new router file. So we import director. See, the, the cool thing about Webpack is even though director is actually a common JS module, we can import it with ES6 syntax. We grab annotate and inject from DI. We grab React, we grab our Frankenstein component. This is what our old Frankenstein app used to look like, right? Like that main file we used to be rendering, but now we're gonna render it from a route. So we have our router, we create our router, and in the home route, we call react.render with that component, which was injected by Angular DI. So it's injected up here, and it's named here, so we could rename this to something else if we wanted. And we render it to the document body. Then in our main, we're gonna do the same thing here. We're gonna import router. We're gonna just initialize that router. So we see nothing here because we're not on a home route. Once we send it over to a home route, we see our app. So now we have a framework agnostic router, which is really kind of one of the, the keys of a polyglot framework, because if we want it in a different route to render with a different view layer, it's very straightforward. You can see in our router, we're calling react.render on the home route, but there's no reason in another route we couldn't call reactive.render or angular.bootstrap, et cetera. We can sort of separate, decouple our routes from our rendering layer, which is what people do on a server side level, if you think about it. When you make a request to a server, you, some routes could be mapped to different backends and rendered different ways, and that's one of the real powers of routing. So decoupling your router is very useful in a lot of ways. And the final leg of our Frankenstein framework is polyfills. I talked about no longer having to write to libraries to abstract the browser. We can now bring the browser forward and all write to the browser platform itself. If you've looked at the fetch polyfill, it's essentially a nice API for XML HTTP requests. I hate that it's called XML HTTP requests except for when I'm talking to people who don't know tech, because then I feel like super, super bad A, like saying excellent, it just sounds smart. Um, but yeah, so the way that we import, uh, the way that we install polyfills is at the beginning of our app, we just import it. What WG fetch. And I didn't install WG fetch, I installed something else. What WG fetch is a library from GitHub that basically gives us a nicer promise-based API for fetching, making asynchronous requests. And you'll see what that looks like in a little bit. So again, we import React, we import annotate, and a concept called inject lazy. What inject lazy does is in Angular 2, it lets us, it gives us a factory function that we can call to then create an instance of our model. So you'll see we get create monster here as opposed to the actual monster instance. Angular 2 DI is, is really awesome. I really enjoy it. Uh, it so far, it's, it's handled every case in terms of creating objects that I've needed. If any of you have used React, this should look really familiar. We have a get initial state, which just maintains a loaded. And then we're gonna make a call out. This is that fetch API we just installed. So we just use it. And once the browsers all support fetch, we take out our polyfill and we're in business. Maybe it has some subtle changes because certain things aren't standardized yet. And we call that a polyfill. Um, I'm not sure which fetch is. 
Do you know that? It's a polyfill, okay. So we make a request out to GitHub, which returns response. We then return the JSON object of that response. Response is an object that contains like git tags, git HTML, git JSON, et cetera. Then we call set state, but we create a monster, which is our model factory, if you will. And in render, if it's loaded, if it's loading, we just paint loading. If it's loaded, we paint the monster. But we need to augment our monster really quick to actually take out that, to leverage that response. I know there's a lot of weird DI language in this. Angular team is like infamous for using really smart words. We have a transient scope, which you can think about as like sort of a, sort of a short-lived object. Every time it's created, it doesn't get cached by the dependency injector, it gets created every time. So every time there's a Frankenstein that's newed up, it gets newed up just for that instance. It's like the monogamous object. So, well, I think I, that should be like patented or something. That was good. So when you create a Frankenstein, take its response, set some properties on the object, really straightforward. So now we're hitting GitHub with the fetch polyfill. You have that really charming photo of myself up there and some stuff from, from the internet, right? We've augmented the platform. But we can make this more interesting really easily. With the agnostic router, we can go in here, we can add a username. In our component, we can just paint this dot prop set username. We're gonna use ES6 template strings so we can interpolate my the username. Then if we go to somebody else's name, we get their GitHub account. So we have a full stack here, and if you're using React, I do recommend Flux, et cetera, but that brings me to my next point. Is this approach viable? I've thought about this a lot, and I'm not certain this approach is viable for a large team, primarily because there's no documentation, there's no like stack overflow, you know, for the, for the oh crap, what's going on here? You're, you're effectively taking ownership of your code in a, in a big way, where normally you could pass that off to framework authors. So I'm not sure this approach is viable, but it is adaptable. We have the ability to render different views with different routes. We have the ability to swap out a router if we'd like. We have the ability to change out our modeling framework for different views, et cetera. We can lazily load code on routes, and we're not coupled to any particular framework. So I, I do think it's very interesting in that way. My goal today was not to sell you on a particular polyglot, but to show you that things are happening in the ecosystem between GitHub, browsers, standardization, et cetera, that you no longer have to think of yourself as a particular framework author. You're not an Angular developer. You're not a React developer. You're a web developer. Thinking in terms of frameworks is gonna limit your mindset and uh, your, your personal growth. And it's gonna hurt the future of the web. I, I believe that people who decide to think outside of framework boundaries are gonna influence the web and standardization in a significant way. And we really, really need that for the future of humans. Um, that's the beauty of the web, is that any of us can contribute to the platform in a significant way. And thinking in terms of a framework limits you significantly. So thank you guys so much. It's been a privilege to have your attention. And thank you, Mike. I really appreciate the opportunity along with the open web. Thank you guys.